Everyone keeps telling me to react to this video. The original official Russian Pokedex. Well, fine, maybe I will. It's even narrated by Alpha Lad. Let's take a listen. And it's a used to crush protests in Southeast Asia. Wait, wait okay, I, I started about seven seconds into that. Let's, uh, maybe we need a little bit of context. Let's get some context for that. Did you know? Blastoise's water cannons are used to crush protests in Southeast Asia. All right, the context did not help. Let's see what Rattata is all about. Rattata are heavily armed thieves, and Nidorina cut the throats of their trainer's rivals? What? I mean, that's just a good Pokemon, to be honest. That's just a good, healthy relationship between Pokemon and person, where the Pokemon wants to see you succeed. I see nothing wrong with this. Well, if you grew up in Russia, you probably did know, but everyone else watching this video doesn't have a clue what we're talking about. These details and hundreds more bizarre descriptions were printed in a Russian Pokédex book published in 2001. We have the whole thing translated, and it's pretty hilarious, so... What? So this is like official information? Seriously? We're gonna read all 151 entries and show all the art, but first, we need about- Why does Wartal look like he's in prison? What did he do? Oh, is stealing from a convenient shop a crime now? Oh, okay. Everyone's so soft nowadays. Now assault is a crime. <laughs> All right. About two minutes or so to explain the historical context here. Early Pokemon games were officially localized into six different languages, but kids in other countries weren't immune to Pokemon fever. So they either had to import and play in languages they couldn't understand, or settle for poorly translated pirated cartridges. One of those kids was Nastya Zhatinsky, a little Russian girl who loved Pokemon but couldn't find out much about them. So her father took it upon himself to study the franchise as best he could with the resources available to him, and write a Pokedex that children could read in their own language. This what? book was widely distributed throughout Russia in the early 2000s and has continued what? to be reprinted and sold even recently. What? They're still selling it? I need to get me one of these. A lot of Pokemon fans in the world's biggest country grew up with their own very unique Pokédex that painted a completely different picture of what the first 151 Pokemon were all about. Imagine the millions, potentially, of Russian kids that grew up just thinking this was canon. This was completely 100% correct. And frankly, about half of them are absolutely meme-worthy and definitely worth reading more than two decades. Decades later. Is that a Panasonic it might battery? Not have been officially sanctioned by the Pokemon Company. In fact, the book's publisher ended up getting threatened with a lawsuit, but Russian kids back then didn't know that. So for them, this book was the Pokédex. I'm surprised they didn't go for it. Are you kidding me? This is widely distributed in Russia. Maybe they just didn't, ca didn't care about Russia. They were like, ah, pff, it's only Russia. It's only like, what, 100 million people? Pff, that's fine. Certainly a lot of kids must have realized it was fake, but some of them really believed Pokemon were a bunch of gang members robbing each other, terrorists overthrowing government. Cops locking them up and journalists writing fake news. A lot of YouTubers. But, whoa! Journalists writing fake news? No, that wouldn't happen. Obsess over the Japanese side of Pokemon, but today we're gonna do something different and look at the Russian side of Pokemon. The story of this Pokédex was brought to our attention by Nintendo Russia employee Annette Ilvers, who's sort of their Pokemon specialist. The guy who put us in touch with Annette was Nob Ogasawara. Dude, this guy is in everything. He had everything comes together when Nob is involved. Nob is the go. He does so many things. He was the original English translator, wasn't he? Who used to work for Nintendo and was the official English localizer for Pokemon Gens 1 through 4. Over the past eight Love months, that, guy. that helped us get our hands on several editions of the Russian Pokédex, translate it into English, and double and triple check the entire translation. Although we should note that Annette didn't do this in an official capacity for Nintendo, it was all in her off hours as a fan who thinks the book's an important part of Pokemon history and- I'm surprised she didn't get like kicked to the cub. She works for Nintendo Russia, right? So in theory, she would get smacked if this is unofficial content. With the way that Nintendo is so protective over their brand, I'm surprised that they allowed her to do this. Worth preserving. She told us, by the time circulation got cut due to legal issues, many children already had it. I asked friends and even those who were not into Pokemon surprisingly still had it as a child. So let's crack this thing open. Before we get to the Pokédex itself, we'll read the book's preface, where the author, Alexander Shatinsky, writes, Dear friends, I wrote this book for my daughter Nastya and her friends. They're very fond of Pokemon and buy the figurines, stickers, toys, and even a small Pokemon radio. They Aw, that's so precious. What a goated dad. Absolutely fantastic parenting right there. He saw his daughter was interested in this series and he had they had no official way to enjoy it. So he did all the research he possibly could and he sat down and made a book as best he could just to entertain his daughter and her friends. What a fantastic father. They also watched the Pokemon cartoon, but there's nowhere they can read about where Pokemon live, how they behave, or what they do. 
To find out, I met with many Pokemon, talked to them, studied the press, then I wrote this encyclopedia and asked the artist Dmitry Gorchev to draw Pokemon illustrations for it. Just That's like so people, cool. Pokemon are all different. Good and evil, calm and chaotic, honest and utter liars. Just like us, they want to find happiness and don't know where to look. Oh my but god, this is too deep. This book helps you understand them better. And if it helps you understand humans better too, the artist and I will be pleased as well. And now for the Pokédex entries. The first couple... Okay, this is gonna help us understand people better. <laughs> I can't wait for this. Bizarre, but they get pretty weird pretty quick. Is he hugging a pineapple? even weirder the deeper we go. It begins, of course, with number one, Bulbasaur. It says, Bulbasaur are a cross between plants and animals. Green bulbs grow okay. on their backs that open at night and bloom big poisonous flowers. All right, that's pretty accurate. That's about how you look at a Bulbasaur and be like, hey, yeah, that bloom flowers, it's poisonous, mixed between plants and animals. That's about, about These right. These are Bulbasaur's main weapon. If you sniff one, you'll die. That's why no okay. one smells Bulbasaur. They also attack with sharp leaves. Bulbasaur yeah, pretty accurate. Bulbasaur likes sleeping in warm swamps. They feel at home there and eat water lilies. They're pretty okay. stupid, but what? don't mean any harm. Okay. Other Pokemon treat Bulbasaur with sympathy, and their owners like to teach them useful skills, like cleaning rooms, because Bulbasaur are happy sure. to serve as vacuum cleaners. Cool. Their are quiet, and their tempers are meek. They're also quite touchy. Eventually, they'll turn into Ivysaur, then into Venusaur. That's Number pretty accurate. Two. No, I think that uh, Bulbasaur's definitely want to be uh, vacuum cleaners. If I know anything about anything that is on four legs, a dog, a cat, etc., etc., is that if you drop something and it is in any way edible, they will consume it. Therefore, we can make the connection that Bulbasaur would do the same thing, like a vacuum cleaner, mopping stuff up off the floor. Ivysaur. If you feed a Bulbasaur mushrooms, it'll turn into Ivysaur. The buds on their backs are very beautiful, and they mostly live in forests and swamps. They okay. go around by hopping, which makes a gross squelching sound. If you're trying to find an Ivysaur, just follow the gross noises. They're okay. sentimental and usually pretty whiny. Ivy that is, sounds exactly like an Ivysaur enjoyer. If Ivysaur is your ba favorite Pokemon, you're probably whiny. Ivysaur are smarter than Bulbasaur, but not by much. Several attempts were made to train Ivysaur for use in wedding ceremonies, but what? the brides were afraid of them. And every venture ended in failure. What exactly are you using an Ivysaur in a wedding ceremony for? As decoration? Are you killing it? Is it the officiator? Does Ivysaur marry the couple? Does Ivysaur become the groom? Recently, they've been getting invited as guests on the TV show to help the florist, where the hosts try to combine them with pineapples in front of a live studio audience. What? Ivysaur actually enjoys it, which proves how stupid they are. <laughs> oh man, there's nothing wrong with enjoying pineapples, although I don't like them personally. I think that's all right. Number three, Venusaur. These massive Pokemon Why does he are look like that? around the house, like carrying heavy objects and guarding the home. But their True. favorite thing is acting like a flower bed in the front yard. True. At the opening ceremony of the Seoul Olympics, 2,000 Venusaur formed a giant living bouquet in the middle of the soccer field. But don't be fooled, they're very fearsome in battle. Where did this Russian father get the idea that Venusaur was at the Seoul Olympics forming a giant living bouquet? Their what? favorite trick is jumping on their foes and flattening them with the weight of their 100 kilogram bodies. And they don't hesitate to poison, bite, and scratch them too. Venusaur sure. are trustworthy and kind, giving their masters yes. rides on their backs and letting them sit between the leaves of their flowers. I think riding a Venusaur would be a fantastic experience. As long as the flowers don't t smell like really bad. I think those flowers could be like the really disgusting flowers that smell really bad. So as long as it doesn't smell really bad, you'd have an enjoyable experience just sit on uh, Venusaur and just go for walks and all that. But Venusaur erupt into rage as soon as they see an enemy. So be prepared. Venusaur will not show mercy. Number four. Scary. Charmander. Is he drinking petrol? What are you doing, mate? He's got such a big belly as well. Where did he get the idea that Charmander was drinking petrol just from like the flame tail? Charmander are so cheerful and playful that they get careless with their tail flames. They light up anywhere, anytime, which causes wildfires. One time a Charmander burned down a clothing store in Tokyo when accidentally brushing its tail against a wedding dress. That sounds Another accurate. Fire happened in a bank when Charmander tried to light a cigarette for a security guard, but <laughs> what? miscalculated the strength of his flame and set fire to the cash register. <laughs> Three million dollars? Turn into ash. Oh man, Charmander, you gotta pay that back. You gotta get a job. You gotta go work at McDonald's now. It's gonna be a while before you pay that one back. Charmander refuel by drinking one liter of gasoline per day. If there's not any gasoline available, they'll refuel with alcohol instead. That makes sense. Both incredibly flammable materials. So Charmander just tills out with a, with a bottle of whiskey. Or what do you call it? A fifth of vodka. But their tails don't burn as well with alcohol, and Charmander gets really drunk and stumbles around. 
Number five, Charmeleon. Charmeleon are is that much a welding more dangerous mask? than Charmander, and their tails burn like a welding torch, which is why they're often employed by welding companies. A couple Facts. years ago, a team of 20 Charmeleon cut the USS Missouri battleship into pieces so it could go to the smelter. Charmeleon are great against ice-type Pokemon, What? powerless against water types, since water can extinguish their tail flames. Charmeleon also serve as lamps in small towns as a replacement for streetlights. They also make good movie actors, cooks, and policemen. Well, until they turn into Charizard, the Flying Terror. They use them as street lamps, which means they just have them sit on a corner all night, presumably. That sounds like a pretty terrible- Oh, it could be asleep! You just make it sleep on the street corner. That's fine, right? Number six, Charizard. Charizard, who people call the Flying Terror, what? are notable for their ferocity and extraordinary gluttony. When their bellies are full, they can't fly anymore and just wander around, waddling from side to side. Me. That's a good time to try and catch one with a net. Charizard are kept in fireproof cages. Before they're set free, Charizard are given gas cans to drink, but they can explode from a single spark, so it's dangerous to smoke around a gas-filled Charizard. Wait, they can explode from a single spark? Their tail is literally on fire. How does that go together? Charizard serve as watchmen for television towers and skyscrapers, but you have to be careful. The Kino television tower in Moscow burned down from the flames with the Charizard guarding it. So nowadays, it's guarded by Zubat and Golbat. Really? By bats? Okay. Where did he get this from? I know he's just making this stuff up, but he's an incredibly creative of mind. Number seven, Squirtle. Cute he's little crosswords. squirtles are usually handled by beginner trainers, but they're hard to train because they don't have ears, so they can't hear their master's orders. Squirtle's <laughs> diet consists of earthworms and tadpoles that they catch in ponds. They're so peaceful that it's hard to believe that they eventually become ferocious war turtle and blastoise. Squirtles do not bite because they don't have teeth. They like doing puzzles, Fair and enough. Offers, taking pictures, and they especially like watching TV and lying on the bottom of aquariums, looking through the thick glass with their round, shiny eyes. Squirrels' voices are hoarse and rough, which hints at the antisocial behavior that they exhibit later in life. Because Squirtles are chain smokers, so they sound like this. They got voices like this because they've been smoking all their lives. Number eight, War Turtle. As soon as There's the criminal. Ears, it turns into War Turtle a creature of a completely different character, behavior, and even education. I would become a different person too if I suddenly gained another sense, but I have all of my senses right now. I have sight, I have sound, I have touch, I have all these, but if you just grow another sense, I'd become a different person too. It's like Superman. What's another sense that you could grow? Spidey sense. Then you become a superhero. It makes sense. War turtles are cocky, vicious, and even vengeful. There's always one or two war turtle at every street fight. Then the police get involved, then court, then prison. Every single war turtle is registered with the police, and half of them wind up in jail for hooliganism. <laughs> These quick-witted and daring Pokemon are fun to have around. They're great swimmers and skilled with a wide variety of firearms. Don't be surprised what? if you see war turtle attacking their own masters. They're really quite nasty little creatures. Oh my god, it makes sense because Blastoise has cannons! So War Turtle needs to be skilled in firearms in order to get cannons when it grows up. It goes from maybe Glocks, an AR-15, to a cannon on its back. That makes logical sense. Number nine, Blastoise. Eventually, War Turtle turn into Blastoise. Disgusting predators with the height and weight of a man. That's not Blastoise very nice. main weapons are the water cannons on their backs that shoot water like fire hoses. For this reason, Blastoise are often used to disperse protesters in Southeast Asian countries. <laughs> in Europe, they're used to water lawns, but they need to be fed on time. Otherwise, hungry Blastoise can kill the entire population of a small town. That seems like an unnecessary risk to take with your lawn. I would just say maybe have a hose that you use manually, as opposed to hiring a creature that if it doesn't get lunch on time, it will genocide your entire town. I don't think that's a really good idea. It's like having a nuclear bomb that waters your plants. You're like, oh no, the nuclear bomb waters my plants, but it's a nuclear bomb. If it goes off, then it kills everyone. Doesn't seem like the reward is worth the risk here. When they're not working or committing atrocities, Blastoise read magazines and newspapers and like car races and paintball. They also love dumplings filled with cabbage. Number Same. 10. He, oh, they're so relatable, dude. They're just like me. When I'm not working or committing atrocities, I also like to consume dumplings and media. Caterpie. These cucumber-sized caterpillars are the most useless Pokemon. Caterpie can't fly, can't swim, can't run, can't shoot, and can't that's not true. Commit fire. All okay, they can well, do that's is specific. Crawl. But it'd be a mistake to think they're completely useless. They have thoughts rolling around in their heads that are sometimes quite sensible and unexpected. One okay. time, a Caterpie startled the Pokemon community with a simple question. It what was that? It went on TV and asked, why do we exist? 
Then it answered its own question. Whoa. It said, there is no reason. Oh my God, that's really existential. And also it applies to humans too. Why do humans exist? When you really think about it, why are we here? There is no reason. Do we exist to procreate and make more of ourselves? That doesn't seem like much of a reason. It is something that we do, but is it a reason for our own existence? I don't think so. Why are we here, chat? Then it crawled away to eat fern leaves. Caterpie are very thoughtful. They're friends with singing teachers, plumbers, and soldiers who got drafted. They asked Caterpie how to live. Oh, soldiers that got drafted? That is way too applicable to current day politics. And it tells them. Caterpie gives different advice to everyone, and that's why they actually do have some value. Number 11, Metapod. In wintertime, Caterpie roll up into big green bags and turn into Metapod. They only retain their eyes and a small nose, although they lose their nostrils. Metapod don't eat or even breathe. They just sit there thinking and waiting to become butterfree. What are they Experience thinking about? Trainers hang groups of Metapods over stoves and radiators so they ripen faster. Unfortunately, it's ripen. quite painful. It's not Metapod. banana. They sweat and suffer, you can see it in their eyes. It's best to put a Metapod under your bed and forget about it until spring. Then, on until spring, it takes the entire time. They're just sitting there with nothing to do, nothing to look at, trapped, unable to breathe, eat, speak, even move for months. I'd go crazy. I think the Pokedex entry for Bottle Bar is going to say something along the lines of having been driven insane by the fact that it was a Metapod. But free go on many genocidal killing sprees. On the first sunny spring day, you'll suddenly see a big butterfree the size of a TV jump out and flop down on the windowsill, basking in the sunlight. Number 12, Butterfree. Butterfree have very hard wings, which they used to beat small animals to death. Let yeah, I knew they would do the genocide. I absolutely knew it. I told you this would happen. This is what happens when you are trapped for months on end without anything to do. Like rabbits and goats, for example. But these butterflies goats? are rarely used for battling. Instead, they're mostly employed as mailmen. Butterfree can be found in the finest homes of California, where they're fashionable to use as fans. Oh, Rich I could use that. It's hot in here now. In their houses and arrange them in circles in their living rooms to blow fresh, cool air on their guests. And the kill them. intelligent Butterfree can parrot commercials they see on TV. Made wisely. Don't wait. Grab a Snickers. Russia, the generous soul, they sing, flying around the mansions of millionaires and Hollywood movie actors. They had Snickers in Russia? Is that a dumb question? I don't know if that's a dumb question. By the way, uh, these popular slogans were from Russian commercials back when this Pokédex was written. They did! So now it makes sense. Number 13, Weedle. Another type of Caterpillar Pokémon, Weedle, are very different from Caterpie in their mobility, determination, and arrogance. Weedle are fast as bicycles when they're chasing mice. Then it puts the mouse in a shoebox, but doesn't eat it. Weedle mostly eat Where does it get shoeboxes from? Green peas. They're poisonous, oh. and if they bite you, it won't heal for a long time. It's strong okay. enough to kill small birds and animals. To become Kakuna, Weedle has to take a warm shower and drink a glass of milk while listening to relaxing music. How is Alpharad saying this with a straight face? I can imagine him smiling while he's reading this. He's sitting there like, dude, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. How do you make this up? It is a worm, rushing dad. You're sitting there like, dude, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk some real, real, real shit here. I'm just gonna say words, string them together, call it a sentence. So if you see a Weedle looking for milk in the fridge, you should know it'll become a Kakuna soon and won't bother you for a while. Number 14, Kakuna. Kakuna Coca -Cola. are 10 what? kilogram Made in China. who are completely motionless and look like they're dead. They're also covered in hard shells that protect them from predators. The fields of the Chinese Xinjiang province are littered with Kakuna. Peasants okay. collect Kakuna to make Kakukala, a healing drink what? that soothes <laughs> stomach aches. And okay. they also make buttons and jewelry out of their shells. You Dude, this was once by Coke, wasn't it? Yeah, a healing drink that soothes stomach aches. Kakukala. You have to be careful in July when Kakuna turn into evil Beedrill. It happens as a sudden explosion. The shells burst and a hungry beedrill crawls out with a terrible howl. If you can't immediately smash it with a shovel, you need to run inside or jump into the nearest river. I'm not usually one to make judgments on something before I truly get to know them, but I do think that bees are e well, wasps are evil. Bees, not evil. Wasps, evil. Bees are altruistic. Wasps are genocidal maniacs. We could annihilate them, if you wanna. Number 15, Beedrill. Beedrill can drill holes through tank armor, factory smokestacks, asphalt, and even icebergs. They don't Whoa. care where, they just like drilling. 
The needles <laughs> yeah, on their they do. aren't just drills. They also use them as syringes to inject poison. When an angry beedrill rushes at an enemy, it makes a disgusting buzzing sound, similar to the squeal of an electric saw. When that happens, try to make sure the enemy isn't you. Beedrill's- Oh, okay. I'll try and make sure of that. <laughs> neck is its weak spot. You can easily tear its head right off its <laughs> bodies by using both hands to yank its antenna. If what? you can do that before Beedrill delivers a fatal injection, you win. If not, you lose. That's crazy. They want us to turn into Doom Guy and just rip and tear their heads off. I use this example every time someone says, Oh, I wish Pokemon was real. No, you don't. You don't wish Pokemon was real. If you wish Pokemon was real, Beedrills are out there now. Beedrills are out there. They're like three foot tall, massive wasp-like creatures that are coming at you with double drills and the stinger. You don't wish Pokemon was real. I would be dead in like five seconds if they were real because Beedrill would come and get you. Number 16, Pidgey. Pidgey look like a cross between sparrows and parrots. They fly in packs and scream loudly. <laughs> Team Rocket keeps a large flock for scouting, using them to report where Pikachu, Arcanine, and other valuable Pokemon can be found. Pidgey eat millet, waffles, and cookies. They can take a small mouse to death, but generally speaking, they're cowardly and traitorous. Pidgey True. are so stupid, it's become an expression. Stupid as a Pidgey is what other Pokemon say. Bird brains. There's a connection there. It makes sense. Most Pidgey are journalists and businessmen. When what? more than three of them get together, you need to plug your ears with cotton and crawl quietly to the other end of the field, forest, lake, or wherever you happen to be. Better yet, just call a Charizard who can swallow an entire pack of these adorably cute Pokemon in one massive bite. Number but if you do to the call the Charizard, please make sure not to make a spark, otherwise you will blow up. 17. Pidgeotto. The most impressive Pidgey turn into Pidgeotto. They're usually used to fight Ekans, who are Pidgey's biggest rival. Whole flocks of Pidgeotto track down Ekans, pull them out of their holes, then carry them high into the sky and let go so they fall to the ground. It oh my god. It two dozen Pidgeotto to catch one Ekans. These That's Pokemon a bad ratio. Are very arrogant. They think they're very beautiful, and it's difficult to convince them otherwise. They love to fly in flocks over the smooth surface of a lake, admiring their own reflections. Sometimes it costs Pidgeotto its life when it's focused on its reflections, then crashes headfirst into a cliffside and dies in terrible agony. <laughs> Several Pidgeotto are United States congressmen. What? Number 18. What? <laughs> Where did that come from? Oh, I get it because they're arrogant. They cause their own deaths. They're stupid. They love the sound of their own voice. I feel like that gels pretty well with a lot of United States congressmen, actually. Never mind. Pidgeot. Even though they come from Pidgeotto, Pidgeot have completely different personalities. They're quiet, reserved, and don't like society. Usually they sit on road signs all alone and drivers ask them for advice like, how do I get to Paris? And they squawk, I don't know, leave me alone. The drivers try to feed Pidgeot cheese and meat pate, but they're very proud creatures who refuse to eat out of people's hands. Notable Pidgeot include one writer, two clowns, and seven hairdressers who live all around the world. Writer? Does it write with its beak pecks? A peck of feet, that's what they're called. Sometimes hunters shoot Pidgeot because they make for easy targets when they're sitting on poles and road signs. Number 19, Rattata. Oh, here we go, here it comes. Hat-sized rats with very sharp teeth. They can bite through thick books or the sole of a boot. More than anything, they love dancing at techno nightclubs. Usually yeah? 300 Rattata show up and dance till they drop. After they wear themselves out, predatory Fero swoop in and gobble them up with their long beaks. Rattata make for good friends. They like to climb on their master's knee and sit there snoring. They'll eat anything, gnawing on books, boots, dishes, closets, and chairs. And they especially love money. If oh, whoa, it's just like me. Guys, I think I'm a Rattata. If you've lost any money, you should know it's probably a Rattata who stole it. Some have managed to squirrel away as much as $15,000 in their what? holes. On their, ho their what? Why do they put the money off around? And, and what? Number 20, Raticate. Raticate are only slightly bigger than Rattata, but much heavier. Imagine an 80 kilogram fluff ball with sharp teeth and a long tail. That's Raticate. With the running start, they can break through brick walls. Oh, that's Raticate's pretty strong. Main occupation is unloading wagons with washing powder, toothpaste, and <laughs> deodorants. 150 what? Raticate can unload a wagon in a single hour. That does not seem that impressive. If they're 80 kilograms, they're pretty big, and they're unloading deodorant, that doesn't seem that impressive. 150 can unload one in an hour? That's not that impressive. I bet I could unload a wagon in an hour. Myself. By myself. I am as strong as 150 Raticate. I think I could do it. But you should never hire them to unload wagons of food. They'll gobble up every last crumb. 
In Thieves. wintertime, Raticate hide in deep holes and eat their stashes of cereal and crackers. Sometimes they fight to get back stolen dollars from the Rattata relatives to buy themselves their favorite <laughs> food, which is yogurt. Not Yo, based! Food. I also love yogurt! I might be a right. Okay. Spiro. Spiro are like Pidgey, except they're even dumber. But they make up for their stupidity by being extra cruel. Despite their small size, one Spiro can easily peck a sheep to death. They usually win in fights against Pidgey, but they don't fight to the death because they secretly love each other. Oh, it's one of those situations like, no, Baka, I don't even like you, but then they secretly like each other. It's a kind of will they, won't they situation, like Pam and Jim from The Office. After the fight, they drink Fanta and sing songs. Some people train their Aww. Spiros for no-holds-barred cockfights. They toss two Spiro into a big cage where they peck at each other, feathers flying everywhere. Spectators throw down bets on who they think will win, but it's all a scam. The fights are usually fixed, and afterwards, the owners split the profits. Oh, Spiro's it's fixed! Most enemies are Nidoran, Nidoqueen, and Nidoking. They can't defeat them in battle, but they do lots of dirty tricks, like crapping on their heads. Number 22. Nice. Firo. Firo hover in the sky. Why is there a Squirtle there? I don't understand why the Squirtle is there. Does Firo give birth to Squirtle? For long periods of time, searching for prey, then swoop down and snatch them with their sharp talons. They live in mountain caves and rock cliffs, and their long beaks are sharp enough to impale a small calf. Firo eggs weigh five kilograms, and the shells are so thick that Firos and their babies can't even break them. So um, <laughs> the babies can't even break them, so they're just trapped inside of the eggshell. Unless some human comes along with like an axe and starts chopping at it. That seems like a really bad evolutionary trait where your eggshell is so thick that your babies literally cannot get out of it. So they just starve and die inside of it. Mother Firo grabs the egg with her feet and throws it off a cliff down onto the sharp rocks below. Then what? the egg breaks and a baby Spiro pops out. Firo That's a squirrel. A very long time. Maybe forever. No one knows for sure because there's never been a recorded case of one dying of old age. They've died in battles to be sure, but not of old age or disease. Number Why Firo specifically? Is he reading a book? Ekans are quiet long killers who live in deep holes. Their burrows have two exits because when Ekans slithers inside, they can't turn around and have to crawl out from the other end. They feed and that's why a straw has two holes. Feed on Firo and Pidgeotto eggs. Ekans keep their own eggs underground and only bring them out once a year during Easter. They lay them out on the grass and paint them different colors using their tails like paintbrushes. Ekans saw this Christian custom on TV and adopted it as their own. Ekans' spit is deadly, and their bites are instantly fatal. Their tails have sharp okay, stingers, that's, that's which are also poisonous. In short, they're very dangerous fighters. In yeah? civilian life, they like to read books about history and philosophy, turning every page with their tail. They're just Number like me. Four, Arba. Arba. Does he have like a base boosted kind of wing cape? What do you call these things? Cobra? It looks like he has a built-in base boosted audio in his body. Boombox. Boombox are giant serpents who weigh almost half a ton and are as long as buses. They use poison and bright beams of light to paralyze their enemies. When they do that, they hiss and remain completely still. After their victims die of fear, Arbok swallowed them whole. They could swallow a whole cow if they wanted to. Their only weakness is that they slither very slowly. Arbok can only slither a distance of its own body length per hour. Fearless Arbok hunters- What? It can only slither its own body length per hour? Oh man, that's really slow. It's got like negative base speed. Behind them and bash their heads with clubs, stunning them, then shove Arbok into a metal pipe and roll it away. But if a hunter that's mean. fails to stun Arbok, he usually gets strangled to death. Number How two. do you know? How do you get caught by an Arbok? It's the slowest creature in existence. You'd have to fall asleep to get caught by an Arbok. In fact, you'd have to fall- You'd have to put yourself into a coma to get caught by an Arbok. Why does Pikachu have Panasonic batteries? Five. Pikachu. Pikachu are cheerful and very famous. They're known all over the world and presidents and kings come to meet them. But their owners love them for other reasons as well. Pikachu is the most famous electric Pokemon. Their tails produce shocks like the naked wires of a transformer. Sparks okay. fly and fires flare. Some of them can even make thunderstorms. You yeah, can yeah. Their Pikachu with ordinary batteries, which last for a week. When the How? sun runs out, Pikachu gets lazy and irritable, crying a lot and wiping away their tears. What? After Pikachu gets some new batteries, it'll bounce up like a ball and sing songs. They love singing on stage and shooting small lightning bolts at the audience. Dude, I love how they've gotten footage to relate to every single thing that's happening on screen. This video must have taken so long to make because they're relating every piece of dumb lore that doesn't make any sense 
to a piece of the anime, which means that the Russian father genuinely did try and watch as much of the anime as he could to write this, even though he probably didn't understand English and he didn't understand Japanese, he didn't know what was going on. And he was just trying to make connections. He was like, oh, this Pikachu must be like singing to an audience right now or something. Number 26, Raichu. Here's oh, a little no. translation note for you. The symbol on Raichu's belly says, do not touch deadly. A Fair standard enough. electric shock warning on Russian Transformer boxes. Anyways, okay, here's the Pokédex entry. If you replace a Pikachu's batteries with a 220 volt power source, it'll turn into Raichu, a powerful That's a thunderstone. electric fighter who can strike with lightning at a distance of 20 meters. Raichu often serve as power plants in rural areas. They're charged once a month and sent on buses to rural transformer stations where their paws are attached to wires. Dealing with them is- <laughs> This sounds like some kind of torture, not- a job that you can a do? A dangerous job that only specialists in rubber boots can do. A single Raichu can charge a TV, a refrigerator, a washing machine, and an iron. Whoa, four devices? But if you want to do any more, you're out of luck. It can only do those four things. Don't ask for anything else. But you should never connect Christmas tree lights to Raichu. They of course. might just burn out. In As general, we all know. Be careful. If you're going to play with Raichu, make sure to wear rubber gloves and boots. Rubber gloves and boots. Like Ash wore rubber gloves in the first episode of the series. He thought, oh, okay, if the Pikachu needs rubber gloves, then a Raichu being stronger requires rubber gloves and boots. He's making connections. I can see the connections that he's making there. Number 27, Sandshrew. Sandshrew are heavy and dumb. Only two or three of them know the multiplication table, and the rest can't even count the claws on their own paws. Even okay. though they only have two. That's Sandshrew mean. are covered with scales similar to floor tiles. When they move, the scales make an awful crunching sound. But if you listen for the crunching, you can figure out where they're hiding and catch one. Sandshrew are one of the few species of Pokemon you can eat. They taste like crab meat and highly prized in Japanese restaurants. Professor Oak is an activist who leads the fight against the barbaric custom of hunting Sandshrew. Oh yeah, no, you can tell. That's what Professor Oak does. Despite their stupidity, many Sandshrew are good at directing traffic and use their tails as signposts and their eyes as traffic lights. Number 28. Sand what? Sandslash. Orbit. It, does it just have a box of chewing gum? Sandshrew are just big chewing gum enjoyers? When was the last time you had chewing gum? I haven't had chewing gum in so long. Or like hedgehogs, but much bigger. And those aren't needles on their back, they're scales. When they're in danger, like getting chased by a Nitto King, they curl into a ball and roll down the road. When that happens, be careful. There were a few times a rolling sand slash flattened an entire company of cadets on their way to a steam bath. They like to eat peanuts, sugarless orbit gum, and tide washing powder? It's really what? hot in Madagascar, so sand slash who live there have scales made of paper. In the springtime, what? they shed their scales and stay naked all summer. When Based. they're naked and vulnerable, they're often preyed upon by Nitto Queen and Nitto King. Fearsome jungle unicorns who catch sand slash and devour them to the last bone. Jungle unicorns? What? And sometimes they eat their trainers too. Number 29, Nidoran What is, female. what is this? Nidoran, you are way too young to have that lipstick and those ear piercings. All right, what is that, Life Magazine? Unlike other Pokemon, the Nidoran family are divided into males and females. The small and pretty female Nidoran are quite rare and have poisonous teeth. They strike up conversations, flirt, and give provocative looks, then suddenly pounce on their chatting partner and bite their neck. Nidoran like to eat cakes, sweets, and lipstick, and love flowers and perfumes. They only read fashion magazines and watch TV, and they love to daydream. You should always be careful around these charming females, though. They're not just toxic, but also huge liars. A few Nidoran work as TV presenters, but more commonly employed as department store clerks. Number three. What? <laughs> He's like, yeah, th those women be lying, though. Nidorina. After maturing, Nidoran turns into Nidorina, evil and grumpy creatures who bite and scratch. They're always mad about something. <laughs> always criticizing the government of the countries they live in. As and also, Nidorina is my bitch wife that divorced me and is super annoying and took the kids. As well as all other governments. But in spite of that, they're actually quite useful around the house. They like oh, interesting. And cucumbers and selling them at the vegetable market. They often read newspapers and go to protests and demonstrations. <laughs> Trainers can easily tame their Nidorina by giving them fake jewelry, rings, earrings, and pendants that Nidorina wear on holidays or when they go to protests. And women be shopping, am I right, fellas? Nidorina are loyal to those trainers till death and happy to cut the throats of their rivals. They're very caring. Apart from the one that cheated on me, Sandra! Number 31. Nido Queen. I swear I got at this. Nido Queen is also like super, super like I I hate Nido Queen. It's super. They're all they're awful. They're terrible. And then the Nido King line is like, oh, Nido King is like a super awesome, a really good king. Everybody likes them. They're really cool. Some especially vicious Nidorina turn into Nido Queen. 
who are as tall as ceilings and heavy as cows. Heavy as cows. Queens of the Nitto family, and despite their weight, they're very agile and dance beautifully. Okay, that's good. Thick tails around. But it's not a good idea to approach one when she's dancing. One time at a party, an overenthusiastic Nitto queen crippled 17 teenagers with her tail. Nitto queen likes to drink, especially champagne with gin and tonic. Some of them smoke pipes. After a Nitto queen's been tamed with gin and tonic, you can use her to carry food and water, <laughs> agricultural work, and removing pavements from roads, which they break open with their tails. They make for good mothers and grandmothers. Okay, no. fair enough. Okay, Nitto queen had a good one. Does Nitto Rena is just nobody likes Nitto Rena. To be fair, Nitto Rena does suck. Okay, too. Nitto Ren male. Nitto Ren all the men. When you have tamed the woman, they make a good mother and grandmother. When you have tamed the. When you've tamed the female with a gin and tonic. <laughs> Tales of the Nitto family, although they don't really deserve that title. Small, suspicious, and cautious, they don't trust anyone and always hide behind rocks, sticking out their huge ears to listen for danger. Nitto are convinced everyone's out to get them, even though for the most part, no one cares about them. Even female Nitto prefer Charmeleon, romantically speaking. What? Nitto have actually grown pretty bitter about that fact and dig their horns in the ground with impotent rage. Oh my god, Nidoran male is an incel. Nidoran male is an Andrew Tate enjoying incel. They often work as journalists writing about new video rentals, books, and theatrical productions. Their art and they complain about how woke it is. <laughs> they say, this new theatrical production had a woman. I'm sick of these woke cinema. Those are cleverly written, but filled with pessimism. If a male Nidoran <laughs> ever manages to pull a female Nidoran, the two make a great married couple. Oh my god, the incel redemption off. Number 33, Nidorino. Nidorino like being bachelors, eating delicious food, and watching soccer on TV. They Let's go! singing folk songs, but it's best not to listen because they don't have any musical talent whatsoever. Oh, Nidorino they sound fun. Good friends and great conversationalists on any topic, although they're most knowledgeable about sports, food, and politics. They attack okay. suddenly, like all Pokemon of the Nidoran family do. If you're talking to one and let your guard down, he'll pounce on you, bite, trample, scratch, and stab you with his horn. But like also in a cool way. Their fits of rage last no more than 15 or 20 minutes. And after that, you can go back to hanging out peacefully. If you're still alive, that is. A lot of them work in the military to attack enemies. Oh my god, Nidorino Nidoreen, is like the quintessential dude bro that joins the army straight out of high school. Number 34, Nitto King. Huge as hippos and tall as trees, Nitto King are the kings of battling Pokemon and capable of spreading terror among civilian populations and the police. As and the police. stomps echo through the streets of a sleeping town, the residents hide under their beds and pray to God for salvation. Nitto King can demolish two-story houses with their tails. They feed on domestic geese and chickens, devouring them by the dozen feathers and all. They Me too. swear incessantly, but their language is unintelligible. However, Me too. a skilled trainer like Ash knows how to make these Pokemon docile and even affectionate. You just need to scratch their bellies with a special wooden comb similar to a rake. They like belly rubs. This goes to show no matter how big the animal, no matter how threatening, everybody loves a little belly scritchums. That makes Nido King purr and roll over on his back and wiggle his paws up in the air. Number 35. That's so cute. The fairy. Clefairy are rare and harmless Pokemon who live in steppes and deserts, where they roll long distances in the wind like tumbleweeds. No one knows what Clefairies eat, or for that matter, why they even exist. Some scientists believe they're actually space dust that fell to Earth and populated the desert. It's nice. quite a beautiful sight to see a huge herd of Clefairy cross the Arabian desert. Looking down from a helicopter, they look like a living pink carpet pushed by the wind flowing slowly over the sands. But like tumbleweeds. Riding camels chase them down and catch them, dry them out, and sell them to foreign tourists as souvenirs. Dry them out? The fairies know how to imitate birds, TVs, and tape recorders, but they're very unhappy in their personal lives. Number 36, Clefable. Clefable aren't much heavier than Clefairy, so they have to use their little legs to walk since the wind isn't strong enough to carry them. They eat mollusks and insects and drink beer. Clefable's bodies are very bouncy, and when they fall, they bounce off the ground like balls. That peculiar trait is why you'll often see them at the circus, working in small troops, jumping and flipping around on wooden boards. Clefables what the fuck? ease and are skilled at learning foreign languages, which allows them to work as tour guides in Italy, Spain, and Portugal. There are but only those countries. Clefable in the northern countries because it's cold up there, and Clefable doesn't have any fur to keep them warm. 
Clefable are all religious. Most are Buddhists, but some are Catholics. Number 37. <laughs> some are Catholics, but most are Buddhists. Like, that's a specific thing. It can, they can only be either Buddhist or Catholic. There is nothing else. Protestant, no shot, brother. It's not happening. Picks. Bull picks are little horses with fiery tails, slightly reminiscent of the hump-backed horse, but more dangerous. Volt oh, that's are cool. Terrorists who use their sense of smell to find what? fuel tanks, weapon warehouses, and if they can't find anything better, firework stands. Then, Volpix sets them on fire. They're not pursuing any commercial or political interests, they just like seeing fire and explosions. But they're just doing it for the funsies? Only Blastoids with their water cans can fight Volpix, but unfortunately, Blastoids are quite clumsy and Volpix run circles around them, overjoyed at the prospect of starting fires. They also love children and setting fireworks off for them. Number 38, what? Ninetales. Ninetales are horses who can fly like rockets. Their fiery tails act like engines and their manes like rudders. People often mistake them for shooting stars and wish upon them, but their wishes are rarely granted, except on very moonlit nights. A Take notes. Ninetales can serve as a powerful weapon capable of burning out a small island nation in the Pacific Ocean. That is way too specific! It is capable of burning out a small island nation in the Pacific Ocean. There's no specific reason why we mention small island nations in the Pacific Oceans, because there are no small island nations in the Pacific Ocean that has been the victim of this. Do not look it up, do not research this. No small island nations in the Pacific Ocean have ever been the victim of Nine Tails before. It has not happened. It was a fabrication. It was made up. Fake news, not real. But if there was a small island nation in the Pacific Ocean that were to get a bit riled up and rowdy, we'll just know that Nine Tails could certainly take care of them. We know that it could take care of them. They have experience, but it hasn't happened before. And they've done it a few times, but newspapers stay quiet. Never mind, they've done it a few times. <laughs> they've done it, uh, wait, they've done it multiple times? How many small island nations in the Pacific Ocean are there for Nine Tails to destroy? Right about it, since reporting on those kind of stories make Nine Tails angry. People say a few Ninetales managed to fly to the moon, but they all died there due to lack of oxygen necessary for fire. When Fucking they're not idiots. Being used in wars, they like to set off fireworks on holidays. Number 39, Jigglypuff. Jigglypuff are adorable and love singing more than anything in the world. Once in the True. company of other Pokemon, Jigglypuff grabs something that looks like a microphone and breaks into song with a gentle voice. However, Accurate so far. Jigglypuff's voices are so gentle that other Pokemon quickly drift off to sleep. Is this going to be the first Pokedex entry that's actually just 100% accurate and not weird in any way? Buff gets very offended by this, so for revenge, they draw on the sleeping Pokemon's faces with markers. The Jigglypuff Opera House has a very unique layout. Instead of seats like a normal opera, it's filled with beds so the audience can drift off in comfort. Jigglypuff are also used medically for hypnotic sessions. They're amorous, shy, and often blush with embarrassment. Jigglypuff loves it when fans give them flowers. They smell them, then they eat them. Oh my god, like everything just seems like it fits completely perfectly. This is the first not weird one. And then you've got Ninetales like nuclear bombing small Pacific Island nations. Number 40, Wigglytuff. When Jigglypuff reach a certain age, they turn into Wigglytuff, who are soft, good-natured Pokemon, but with subtle signs of insanity. When Wigglytuff <laughs> are in danger, they'll inflate too. like balloons, sometimes as big as a blimp. No one's scared of them though, and some people use inflated Wigglytuff as toys in the pool or ocean. Kids love to roll around on them, climb on top, and jump off into the water. Wigglytuff pretends like it makes them mad and puffs up even more, but actually they secretly enjoy it. They That's love adorable. They collecting stickers and sticking them onto their naked bodies. A Wigglytuff okay. covered with stickers well. is a comical but spectacular sight. Some prefer painting themselves with advertisements, though. Oh my god, they take ads. They take ad slots. That's like taking a sponsor, but then adding it to your body. Imagine taking a sponsor and tattooing it to your body. That's the ultimate sponsorship. Number 41, Zubat. Zubat Jesus Christ. do not have any eyes, only teeth. They don't need eyes because they live in caves and find their way around with echolocation, like bats do. Zubats like to feed on Taurus and cave researchers. When they see an opportunity, they dive with lightning speed at unsuspecting cavers and bite their necks. Their sharp teeth are venomous, but not fatal. They're more like tranquilizers. Zubats swoop down and suck the blood from sleeping researchers and Taurus, then fly away satisfied. That sounds it's about unpleasant accurate. pleasant for their victims, sure, but not life-threatening. What's even worse is a chorus of Zubats singing in a dark cave. Their voices sound like vacuum cleaners and echoes carry the sound deep into every nook and cranny. They only sing the classics like a march from the opera Aida, Ride of the Valkyries, and Ode to Joy by Beethoven. <laughs> Number 42. What? What the f- They sing Ode to Joy? Golbat. 
No one knows how these strange Pokemon fly. They're the Why is he in a military outfit? Same size as Zubat, but heavy as pigs. They flop about, drink blood, swell up, and wander around caves dragging their wings. Basically, they're just deplorables and nobody cares about them, not even cops or journalists. They like telling stories about their younger days, like when there were army Zubats who could drink three buckets of blood. They're probably lying, but no one cares enough to look into it. Actually, Golbat are pretty pitiful when they're stumbling around their caves, no good to anyone living way oh my past God. the time and mumbling their favorite song. Oh, to joy. Golbat, Dad. Dad, Golbat, you didn't what? hide your wings behind boys' backs. Oh, what? No, what boys' backs? There's no boys in the cave, only tourists. You didn't hide your heart behind boys' backs. What is going That's on? Okay, this definitely needs a bit more explaining. Golbat singing is a reference to an old Russian military song. This is the kind of thing where if it was a video game, localizers would just swap out the joke with something completely different, but we're trying to stay as true to the source material as possible here. There's certainly some wordplay here, but it's too hard to explain and doesn't really make any sense in English. It's just too confusing. On to the All next right, one. I believe Number you. 43, Oddish. Oddish are optimists with dark Oh my god, they have little dummies in their mouth. Of humors and distant relatives of the Italian Cipollino. That's what? an Italian fairy tale, by the way. The leaves on their heads are poisonous. So I'll how does this Russian guy even know all of this? He's a very knowledgeable individual. Not only has he done insane amounts of research, but he's just a guy that knows a lot of things. So some oddish with edible leaves were recently discovered. They make for delicious salads. These strange Pokemon don't have arms, so you have to spoon feed or give them pacifiers. In Japan, they have oddish feeding stations with plastic pacifiers stuck on the walls. Oddish like to drink fermented milk, coffee, and Japanese sake, then sing songs as they march off on a violent raid. Oddish what? Lots of jokes about Pokemon. They Violent rays? Even in garbage cans. If you hear laughter coming from a garbage can, there might just be an Oddish in there telling jokes. Number Hold on. 44. No, 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 we're not skipping over the Violent Raids part. Where, where are they raiding? Hopefully not small Pacific Island nations. Gloom. In the Pokedex artwork, Gloom's shaking hands with Kalabuk, a ball-shaped character from Russian folklore who's made of dough. He's probably just here because they kind of look similar. Anyways, Gloom's dex entry says, if you water the leaves on an Oddish's head with potassium, eventually spicy mushrooms grow sprout and it'll turn into Gloom. Gloom like to mock and antagonize people, so they tend to get slapped a lot. Then Fair they enough. stumble down the street, crying about their fate, even though they've got no one to blame but themselves. Most Gloom like writing poetry, which is why they have such tiny hands. But their poems what? are terrible. Aww, oh, that's Japanese, not fair. Though, so hardly anyone understands them since Gloom live in the United States. That's what? because all Oddish grow up dreaming of moving to America. <laughs> all Oddish grow up with one dream, the American dream. Americans make Tabasco sauce out of Gloom's spicy mushrooms, but the mushrooms themselves should never be eaten. Number 45, Vileplume. Vileplume live in poor neighborhoods. They hardly move and just bask in the sunlight squeaking. They try to garner sympathy from people walking past telling stories about how they become edible mushrooms, after being poisonous and inedible in their younger days. People in those neighborhoods all got used to having Vileplume around and use them as chairs in cafes and restaurants and- They use them as chairs? Conversations with them. Oh, come on. They're poor, they're down, they're out of luck, and you're using them as chairs? That's just embarrassing. That's too much, that's too far. Vileplume speak English with such terrible accents that everyone laughs at them and gives them sips of their Coca-Cola. Vileplume's mushrooms are edible. He loves Coca-Cola. Everyone's afraid to eat them because Oddish and Gloom have such bad reputations. That's what happens when you take too long to get your act together. Vileplume you tell them sharing their old poems from when they were young and don't write any new ones either. Would they realize that no one in America can speak Japanese? Like, hold on a minute. They speak bloody English. Number 46, Paris. Paris is he knitted? Of mushrooms. Oh my god, he's knitting. loves them, even though they have steel claws sharp enough to cut through a human leg. Instead of ears, they have poisonous mushrooms that can inflict paralysis. So it's a mystery why people love them so much. Maybe for their big, beautiful eyes. They look so kind. Paris sidle up to people, if I'd call them beautiful. They like, look up trustingly from below. Since they're only as tall as a stool, then shoot out spores. Then they bite the limbs of the lifeless body. Oh and my god. Time, they like to talk about non-resistance to evil and secrets of the psyche. Paris what? are quite clueless. Number 47, <laughs> Parasect. Parasect like to hide in cellars, although there are some cellars they can't fit in because they're huge and as heavy as hippos. And they have cats their on. claws to catch mice, rats, and cats, and then eat them. The giant mushroom serves as both a Parasect's head and its hat, which is pretty convenient. Parasect are all blind. Many crimes weigh on a Parasect's conscience. When it a <laughs> young Paris, it'll tell them about the worst crimes it ever committed, like how it turned into a Parasect, for example. 
To evolve, it had to eat all the employees in a Miami insurance company after putting them to sleep with poison. 75 human lives. Uh, oh my god, I, I can't even begin with this one. Does every Paris need to consume a Miami insurance company? in order to evolve? Is there a real epidemic with Miami insurance companies? Do they have to install like turrets at the doors of Miami insurance companies to make sure no Paris come around and consume all 75 of them? They just wanted to help Parasect by selling it life insurance, but ironically, it turned out that they were the ones who got killed. Number 48, <laughs> Irony. Venonat. Venonat lives in hollow trees. That's where they're born, live their entire lives and eventually die. They never leave their tree unless they turn into a Venomoth one day. They like listening to the radio, especially the latest news. When the news is over, Venonat poke their heads out of their tree and start yelling at the whole forest. They're oh my god, Venonat are old men that never leave their house and continually just listen to Fox News all day. They sit there listening to Tucker Carlson talk about how there's evil immigrants on the street that are coming to get them. And they're like, oh my god, there's evil people on the street, they're coming to get me! And they poke their heads out and they start yelling at people. They're always yelling about the same thing, that the end of the world is coming. Yeah, they definitely listen to Fox News, there's no way. They end their yelling with, don't forget what I told you, then go back to hiding in their trees. Venonats are poisonous, but nobody knows why. Their voices are nasty and their eyes are bloodshot from constant screaming. This is the quintessential old white guy that listens to Fox News. But if you approach one in the evening, light a fire under its tree and speak to it calmly, it'll act like a completely different Venonat and open up to you, revealing its sad and lonely side. Oh my god, it is! Everything about this is screaming just normal old guy. Or not normal, but like old guy. 49. Venomoth. If you've laid eyes on this giant butterfly and survived, count yourself lucky. Venomoth weigh 300 kilograms and can bite the head off a dog or even a horse. That Only is so much. Only a few Venomoth managed to eat enough honey to turn into Venomoth. They can't fly very Honey. well, three or four wing flaps, and then they flop to the ground. Some people tame Venomoth, then put them on trucks to show them off to their neighbors. An adult Venomoth sells for $500 on the open market. They work as nannies taking care of babies, the sick- Hold on, they work as nannies taking care of babies? I don't know why you would give a moth, a 300 kilogram moth that can bite the head off of a dog easily, your child. They can't even fly. How is it going to take care of your baby? It can't even maneuver by itself. It has to be put on the back of a truck. And the elderly. Venomoth have no interest in politics. Tame Venomoth feel contempt for their wild relatives, who resent that contempt. And at least once a month, a wild Venomoth murders a tame one. Oh no. 50. Diglett. Small diglets in ditches and roadsides. They don't have mouths, but they can absorb nutrients from soil. And they like to hide underground and dig passages. If you're careless and accidentally step on a diglet, it'll explode. If it's a happens, mine? Diglet's roots remain in the ground and eventually diglet grows back. Good as new. Oh my god, they have roots. This entire time we were wondering, do they have bodies down there? Do they have feet? Like, how does a diglet work? Do they have arms? How do they use scratch? They have roots. The entire time, he knew. We never knew! If Diglett's a mine, then what happens to Dugtrio? Is it just like, nettles? Like weeds? An exploding Diglett can obliterate small Pokemon like Pidgey or Clefairy or even a human leg. People with domesticated Diglett plant them in windowsill pots and water them with Sprite or sometimes Fanta. Sometimes their owners use them as fireworks or to blow up cars with loud car alarms that won't stop wailing. If you hear a car alarm going off in the middle of the night, a Diglett will probably come along soon enough to blow it up. Oh my god, they're doing domestic terrorism. They're doing like car bombs with diglets. Number 51. Dug oh Christ. Trio. Three diglets can combine to become one Dug Trio. They may be small, but they have a terrible explosive power. On a few occasions, Dug Trio blew up entire trains. Oh this my makes god. Them useful for military purposes, similar to landmines. But their nature is really quite peaceful, and more than anything, they like discussing movies and gossiping about actors and pop stars. Dug Trio chats ceaselessly, all speaking at the same time, but able to understand each other perfectly. Oh, uh, it's like XQC. Once they've had their fill of gossip, they'll find a bank burrow underneath and blow it up. They're also what? employed by robbers they who peaceful. say they'll Dug Trio once they've regrown from the roots, but it's a trick. By the time they've grown back, the robbers already ran off. Dug Trio don't like their work, but they don't have much choice in the matter since they don't know how to do anything else. They're quite cute and very friendly. They could just not work for criminals. They could work for, like, mines. There's always people that need to blow stuff up. Like controlled explosions when you tear down a building and then you put up a new one. You don't have to go for a life of crime, guys. These robbers, they're not gonna treat you right. They're not gonna treat you like you deserve to be treated, Dog Crew. You deserve better than that. You deserve to gossip about pop stars like Hannah Montana. Number 52, Meowth. 
Meowth are very enterprising cats, and friends with Team Rocket. They're terrible scoundrels, frankly speaking. Their main weapons aren't claws or teeth. It's espionage, betrayal, slander, <laughs> and deceit. Meowth know how to earn the trust of government officials and ministers, then tell them false stories, make them afraid of peaceful Pokemon, and play treacherous games, which results in unethical laws getting written. Oh Meowth my god! Presidents. But not for long, of course. Eventually, Meowth get exposed and deported to another country. Then they start the horrible cycle all over again. It actually starts to get annoying after a while. Seven Meowth hoard almost the entire Pokemon money supply. A total Seven? Of about three million dollars. The entire That's Pokemon why. money supply is three million dollars? Okay, to be fair, that doesn't really sound like a lot. The entire Pokemon money supply is three million dollars. It costs the same amount for Hassan to buy a house. Other Pokemon hate Meowth and try to assassinate them, although they rarely succeed. Okay, um, we need to cut in here with some bad news. This Pokemon oh, no. only featured original artwork for the first 52 Pokemon and a few others, but the rest just used their official artwork made by Game Freak. So no. far, I've been referring to this Pokédex as a book, but it was actually spread across five editions, with each one covering about 30 Pokémon. It seems the lawsuit we mentioned earlier is why the Russian artwork wasn't printed in later editions. We wanted to reach out to the book's author and illustrator to confirm that fact and find out if the rest of the Pokémon had Russian artwork made that just never got published. We'd really love to see them all. Unfortunately, contacting them proved impossible for reasons we don't want to get into now. So, well... I mean, I can imagine why it might be difficult. There, there's, there's a few reasons in current day why that would, might be hard. We'll talk about it at the very end. We managed to collect a few missing pieces from the illustrator's website. For now, though, let's just say that if there were ever a full set of 151 illustrations, a good chunk of it appears to have been lost to time. Okay, let's continue. That's Number so sad. Persian. Millionaire Meowth turn into Persian who ride in armored cars with primate bodyguards and get interviewed by newspapers. But what? they're terribly unhappy, always calculating something in their minds and convinced they've been robbed somehow. They Sounds like a cat. They everyone around them and scratch them with their claws. They apologize later, but by then it's too late. Their victims press charges and Persian get dragged into court where they spend a fortune on lawyers and bribing judges, but still have a hard time avoiding prison. Alas, this is no way to live. This sounds like a normal cat. Would they lash out first and then apologize later with cuddles? They try to bribe you, rubbing their head up against your legs, saying, Oh no, I'm actually sorry, can you give me dinner now? This is just a normal cat. A wise Psyduck once said, To be a Persian is to never know happiness. Occasionally, Persian pay for the construction of a new McDonald's, and everyone's happy for a few days. They all get burgers and Happy Meals that come with little plastic Persian toys. They do Number propaganda. 54, Psyduck. Psyduck are clumsy, fat platypuses who everyone thinks are dumbasses and mockingly refer to them as psycho ducks. That's they not fair. They psychic energy when they get hit on the head. They rarely get angry, but when they do, they can paralyze people. Psyduck are actually the wisest of all Pokemon, but Cap. they're careful to conceal their wisdom. They lock themselves in attics and write thick books only to bury them deep in the sands of a beach. <laughs> what? Like to think maybe someday some kids will dig in the sand, discover their books, and read them. Psyduck spend their entire lives in poverty. They, oh, they can't be that fucking smart if they're so poor, huh? They can only afford to survive because their friends give them food, and sometimes they wash cars to earn a little pocket money. Well, here's the thought. Why don't you sell the book that you've made instead of burying it in a beach, you idiot? Ooh, smartest Pokemon. Yeah, it's so, so you say. Trainers don't think they have any use as fighters. Number 55, Golduck. Hosh much? Oh, am I being too mean to the fictional duck? You get tired of being poor and hungry, eventually sell out and lend their right to sell to out? corporations like Galena Blanca or Blenda Med to get rich. <laughs> then they turn into gold duck, which means golden duck. Because they, they got money! They newly earn cash on refrigerators and TVs, make friends with people who work in newspapers and television, and then try to break their bad habit of waddling when they walk. They yell loudly in English, I can afford to buy whatever I want. They've given up writing books. Now they only write articles and advertisements. They're always muttering under their breath, swearing quietly and shaking their heads in disapproval. They try to be like Wartortle, but don't have what it takes. Wartortle can fight, but Golduck can only beat around the bush. What? Oh my god, they turn into Scrooge. They turn into Scrooge McDuck when they get rich.
they become jaded, angry, and upset. It's Scrooge McDuck! Six, Mankey. Mankey are personal bodyguards, usually for movie stars, pop idols, and middle-class businessmen. But Not high class. they're lazy and don't know how to do anything besides wave their fists around. Police departments never employ them. Mankey run a bit of a side hustle, changing gum for cigarettes, cigarettes for Coca-Cola, then Coca-Cola for beer. They nice. don't trade the beer, though. They just drink it themselves in large quantities. When they're drunk, they start talking crap about their trainers. That's when Mankey's petty nature is on full display, so it's best to just tune them out. They love reminiscing about that time they killed a bunch of terrorists in the <laughs> mountains of Nepal. What? The story was actually written by a poor Psyduck in exchange for a bottle of Coke, but nowadays Mankey act like it really happened. They're so unsympathetic and don't feel sorry for anyone. Number 57. Of course, this is a really long video, which means that if you'd like to see the rest of the entries, you can go and watch them yourself. Go and watch the Did You Know Gaming video. Watch the full thing. Go and see what happens from Primeape onward. And if you liked our reaction here, then maybe we'll look at some more in the future. But it's a really, really long video. So it's not possible to do it just in one. But if you have any suggestions for stuff you'd like to react to, leave it in the Discord server.